Yeah. Oh, I didn't even realize. Yeah, give me one second. Uh... Yeah, it's live and then um, it archives immediately. Um, okay. So it's actually pretty pretty simple and pretty good. Um, what link should I send? The one that's... Uh, I tweeted out the link, so the link will be in my tweet. Okay. And you just muted yourself, right? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. All right. I was just yeah, looking for this for a while. I'm not talking about it now with Mike. All right. Okay. Ready? Yes. Okay. So here we are. Um, the election is on everybody's minds, justifiably so. Um, even if we wanted to talk about something else right now, it would probably be almost impossible. Um, yeah, try try finishing a novel in the midst of this. It's quite a <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, for me personally, there's such a deluge of data yeah. that comes in in the aftermath of the election that I have to just sort of focus on that almost twenty four seven for the next week, if not more. Because yeah, it's a, it's funny we have the opposite challenge, and I'm and I'm doing everything I can. And failing for the most part to try to screen myself to screen some of that out from my life, so I can stay in the world of the story that I've been working on. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but it's uh, it's really a challenge, and one of the things that I really like about what you've been doing and I've been trying to do it myself is look, there's so much data, right? There's so many things we can focus on that it becomes even more important to develop a proper framework for understanding what's happening or what has happened, and. Um, and one of the things that's amazing to me, even though it shouldn't be, is how resistant so many Democrats are right now to what in any other context would be a purely common sense axiomatic reaction, and it's, which is this. The, the primary responsibility for losing an election has got to rest with the candidate and the campaign. Doesn't mean that there aren't other lessons to be learned in other venues. I'm sure there are, but the primary responsibility and therefore the primary focus should be on whether this was the best possible candidate, how uh, a different candidate might have been chosen and might have performed, and second, how the campaign could have been done more effectively with the benefit of hindsight. So many people are resistant to that right now. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't seem to bode well for 2020 to me. Yeah, that's definitely true. And, you know, <laughs> I had a glimmer, you know, the, the, the magnitude and the breadth of the failure is just so, so staggering yeah. that you think it would just compel or coerce them to really engage in a thoroughgoing evaluation of what they did that brought about this failure. But yeah. Yeah. They are so, but, but they're so arrogant. I mean, and, I, and I'm going to be a little harsher because, because I don't want to... Uh, and I have been harsh in the past couple of days because I think people deserve it, but they're so arrogant and they're so insulated and they're so self-assured that they won't accept that there was anything that they did yeah. personally that led to these circumstances. So I actually think it's sort of a catch-22 that Hillary ended up winning the popular vote, right? Yeah. Um, so she won it by what? It's 0.2% or something like that. Maybe yeah. it could inch up a little bit as you know, California, yeah. more California votes trickle in. But now they're, they're, you know, they're going to the, the people who are the Clinton loyalists, as I like to call them, or the people who are in that crowd which abetted her and enabled her. Right. They're going to point to that popular vote victory as some kind of semi vindication. I know. I know. Um, and they're going to they're, they're going to use that to deflect blame from themselves. They're going to say, "Oh, we won." Well, first of all, I mean, no, they didn't. Yeah. Trump didn't. Trump devoted zero resources to California or New York or New Jersey or Washington or Oregon. Right. So. He didn't make any effort at all to turn out Trump's sympathetic voters in those states. Right. Nor should had he. he right. Nor should he have. I mean, no, had he, the result could have been right. totally different. And the Clinton people. The pot, yeah, that's right. The Clinton people were so uh, hubristic, had so much hubris, yeah. that even with a week or two weeks to go, I mean, the reporting coming out now is just amazing. They were devoting uh, resources to expand the map. That's the big cliche. Yeah. So in Arizona, the second the uh, second congressional district of Nebraska, yeah. um, even Utah, yeah. and they and they totally um, took for granted Michigan and Wisconsin. Yeah. So I mean, those are 
all are kind of congealing to give these Democrats and these liberal media personalities an excuse yeah. to not accept the blame that is incumbent on them. Yeah. And psychologically, I think it's easy to understand why a lot of people would feel defensive right now. Because if you make a living um, based on political acumen and prognostications and your status is dependent on that sort of thing, and you get something as catastrophically wrong as this election, it, it gets right to the very heart of your own self-conception. So, of course, you're going to see a defensive reaction on people who are in that position. So, in, in that sense, I get it, and I'm even somewhat sympathetic. But what's a little frustrating is I feel like, look, for the most part, people make good good faith mistakes. I mean, I backed Bernie in the primaries and I still think he would have been the stronger candidate in the general, but I don't know. There's no way to know for sure. It's, it's speculative. Um, and I, I have no trouble believing that the people who backed Hillary all along believed in good faith, albeit in retrospect mistakenly, that she was going to be the stronger candidate in the general election. And I, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not interested in blaming anyone. It's not, blame is even the wrong word. I've had some of this, I've had a discussion along these lines on Facebook where people are being really defensive and like, well, you're blaming this and you're blaming that. And I'm like, look, it's really not a question of blame. It's, I, I'm trying to think of analogies that can, that can make it easier for people to understand what, I, what they seem to be resisting understanding. So here's one. I said, look, if you're a salesperson and buyers seem reluctant to buy your product, um, what makes more sense? rethinking the product and uh, recalibrating your sales pitch on the one hand or blaming buyers for their reluctance to buy on the other. I mean, nobody would argue that. It's simple. Or if you had a football team that was heavily favored to win and they took the field and they got their clocks cleaned, it would just be axiomatic to say, well, was this, do we have the different players in the right position? Uh, did we adequately account for weather or the other team's tactics? Are there any tactics that we might have used differently based on what we know now? Everybody would know that you have to ask those questions and that if you didn't, if you were the coach, for example, and you refused to engage in that sort of activity after a devastating, unexpected loss, that you're not even, you shouldn't be the coach. The coach should be replaced. Or in a military campaign, if there's a battle where you're heavily favored to win and you get wiped out, I mean, the military even has a name for this. It's a good name and it's a good, uh, it's a good process. It's called an after action report. No matter what happens, you try to learn lessons from what you did that seemed to go well, what you did that didn't go well, and what you can learn from the experience and apply going forward. In all contexts, this sort of thing is axiomatic and the amount of resistance right now to the exercise that I'm seeing on the part of democratic partisans is, um, is a source of concern. It's, it's not that we shouldn't be talking about all the things that some people think uh, that, pro that certainly were factors and in no particular order of importance. Yes, racism, misogyny, uh, journalists, um, unfair coverage, um, WikiLeaks, uh, Glenn Greenwald, um, um, third party candidates, Bernie bros as, uh, as they're, um, as they're uh, mistakenly called. All these, did, did all these things have some sort of impact? Yeah, I guess so. But why are we focusing on things that matter only at the margins that are entirely predictable in every single election and that a skilled candidate can certainly find ways around? Why are we focusing on those instead of what obviously matters most, which is the candidate in the campaign? Yeah. And you know, there's this effort to trivialize or marginalize um, the process of doling out blame to those who deserve it mm. by calling it the blame game, right? So if you're, in, if you're engaging in the blame game, you're just doing this sort of pointless exercise that's sort of self-aggrandizing and it doesn't actually do, mean any, do anything constructive. Right. But that's wrong because in order to carry out an effective after-action after report, you have to decipher who warrants the blame. And they have to accept that they're blameworthy for their actions. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, that's just one example of blameworthiness. In the Democratic primary, the, the, an argument was marshaled on behalf of Hillary by her supporters in the media, in the operative realm, in this sort of like overlapping magisteria. Right. Um, as um, uh, as an epistemologist might put it. Um, there was this meme that they were propagating that was eagerly regurgitated by journalists. Right. Hillary was the clear, clearly the electable candidate. Right. And that's why it wasn't worth the gamble um, on Bernie, even though he 
was polling consistently much better than Hillary, sometimes by even 10 points. Yeah, in every possible okay. configuration, including Jill Stein and Gary Johnson or without them. Exactly. And Bernie's popularity was increasing with the public the longer that he was exposed to the public. Right. So a lot of people who don't follow this stuff closely, I mean, for, for somebody like me and maybe even you, it can be difficult to get into the mind of somebody who's just very t only tangentially aware of politics. But even uh, even late into the primary process, so let's say April or May of 2016, this year, Bernie was not that well known of a person yet yep. in the eyes of many. He only just sort of come onto the national scene a little a few months ago, where it's Hillary. She's been a known quantity um, for for something like 25 years. Right. Um, and, and as she receives sustained exposure, she became less popular. Right. So that's why they sort of hid her in the in the summer after the Democratic convention. Right. And she only did like a couple events in August. I have to. I, want, I should look at the final tally, but it was like a third or less of the number of tr events that Trump did. She was fundraising instead. Yeah. She was out in the Denver Hills or the Hamptons or um, you know Upper West Side, those sorts of places. It's what she does well. Yeah, it's where she's most comfortable. It's where she rehearsed her deplorables rant. And then because it was so well received in these elite fora, she thought, oh, you know, I'm going to test it out in public at this um, LGBT gala in September. But they, that, they, that was actually a fundraiser also, but they invited the press to it for the first time, and that became a sort of, like, I don't know, scandalous moment. But th this is all just to say that you know, the reason why doling out blame is worthy and necessary because unless people accept the blame that, um, accept blame for their actions, right? Then nothing is going to change. I mean, unless there's tangible, you know, discernible penalties that people have to pay for making consistently wrong yeah. predictions when they're paid professionally right. to do this, when this is their line of work, right? So yeah, it might it might rupture their kind of conception conceptions of themselves. So be it. I mean, the yeah. public interest demands that they <laughs> face consequences. Agreed. The only thing I would that I would put differently, and it probably makes no difference anyway, is being uh, being aware of the human psychological reaction to resist being blamed and to get defensive as a result. I'm really trying hard not to even conceive of it as any kind of uh, exercise in blame. It's there's a, an expression like "don't fix the blame, fix the problem." And that's really what interests me here. I mean, I'll just say, like, like obviously something went wrong. Obviously, a lot of smart and well-meaning people chose uh, probably the wrong candidate and certainly the wrong com campaign. And uh, it's it's tough because I, I don't feel like, and the word blame really hasn't even been on my mind. I keep asking the same question, which is just, what can we learn from this and apply in 2020? That's it. And in response to that, I'm getting I get a lot of strange responses. For example. Um, uh, it was racism. Just you know, one quick example is racism, and I'm like, look, racism is a known quantity in in America and the human race, and it's clearly not it's not impossible to overcome it, because Obama did in 2008 and 2012, right? So um, I'm not saying that racism in a, isn't a factor, but it's always a factor, and a good campaign will find a way to um, to get past that. Likewise, misogyny, likewise other structural factors that are just a constant in politics and um, in human nature. So I don't know, it's been a little bit of a challenge when I see people like um, Peter Dow still tweeting uh, at uh, Cenk Uyghur that like Cenk lost the election or something like that. And you know, then it does get a little frustrating because I feel like, look, I'm, I'm really trying to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm not saying this is all your fault, even though if I wanted to, I could I could make a much better case that Peter Dow is to blame for this whole, this whole thing. I mean, his tweets were a huge turnoff for me because he sounded he sounded like he'd taken flight from reality in his, um, in his zeal to get his candidate elected. But whatever, that's just not a productive conversation. So I'm like, let's just put that aside. Let's talk about what we went, went, what went wrong and what we can learn for it. And then I come across from it, and then I come across these tweets where he's blaming a journalist for not being sufficiently enamored of his candidate. And I'm just like, Jesus, what are we going to do? I mean, the first step to solving a problem is just to admit that you have one. If you won't even do that, uh, it's going to be tough in four years. It's going to be tough for the next four years. Yeah. And you, you know, the thing, if people are allowed to labor under the illusion that racism, you know, pure old fashioned racism was the sole factor that led to the defeat of Hillary. Yeah. Again, this same cycle is going to repeat in some incarnation in the future because that's just false. Yeah. 
of course. I mean, it, there's always going to be an, an element of truth to that. Nobody denies it. Um, it's a challenge, but, no question. Yeah, but you had, you know, for one of the most remarkable statistics, I think, is that Obama won rural voters in Wisconsin yeah. by eight percentage points in 2008, okay? Yeah. Trump won rural voters in Wisconsin by 29 points. Right. Okay, so you're going to tell me that people out in the, in the cow country of Wisconsin somehow uh, voted for Obama despite racial animus at least once and probably even twice in some cases. And then I, I don't know what happened between over the course of those eight years, they somehow Outbreak became racialized and, and decided that Trump was the best, you know, uh, vehicle to express their racist views. I mean, that's that just doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and you have these, um, for the longest time since Trump, you know, became a formidable political force, there's been this little meme that's gone around these elite liberal punditocracy circles, and you know, and, and because I'm I'm trying to achieve a measure of accountability here, I am going to name one of the people, and I, it's not to embarrass him, it's not to humiliate him, although I think he he should feel humiliated because his and now he's a professional political uh, analyst and he's been dead wrong about everything, every step of the way, right? So that should merit some personal shame probably i can think uh, of a few who you might be talking about well i'm talking about this guy brian boitler b-e-u-t-l-e-r at the new republic um so he 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 coined this little meme where um whenever somebody whenever like some trump supporter was identified doing something unseemly let's say or something yeah. nasty or calling hillary a bad word yeah it would get you know it would it would rocket around the twitter sphere and, and brian would come and say oh this must be the economic anxiety again so he was oh mocking god yeah yeah i've seen a lot of that yeah. yeah so he was so he was mocking the notion that economic anxiety was in any sense a source of trump's support yes. right um but now so, so him and his cohort you know they like they like to conceal themselves as very data driven and data data oriented you know right. just the facts ma'am um just the data and the data now, um, as per 538, which is one of their favorite websites, right? Yes. Which is a you know, good, good, good resource. Nate Silver. You know, they, they, yeah, Nate Silver's website put out a piece, um, maybe it was yesterday or the day before, confirming that, yes, economic despondency did correlate totally. with where Trump support increased right. co compared to 2012. So that totally obliterates this sort of smug liberal dismissal of economic anxiety right. being partially um, attributable yeah. for, for why Trump gained a yeah. sufficient support to win the Electoral College by a comfortable yeah. margin. Yeah. So, you know, if, if somebody of Boitler's ilk doesn't accept that they were wrong, right. it doesn't, doesn't adjust their analytical framework, right. And he's in a position of prominence and influence within the, within the Democratic Party kind of intellectual infrastructure. Right. How can we have any confidence that anything is going to change moving forward? It's a good question. I don't know. I agree about the um, this weird uh, tendency. Actually, it's not so weird if anyone anyone who's watching, if you don't know what confirmation bias is, it's a really interesting uh, human phenomenon and just Google it and, and read up on it. But this thing where again and again, I've seen people <clears throat> tweeting some example of something that's say racist and then they're like well i, I see it's economic proof of um the economic uh anxiety theory even really good journalists who I admire i saw um charles pierce from esquire who i think is great but he posted um something on twitter today which was two white people in t-shirts and the t-shirt said uh Trump and then like like Trump supporters and it said fuck your feelings to everyone else and he's like oh I, I see the economic anxiety is um, is doing its thing and I thought if you just think about it for a second 60 million people roughly voted for Trump I'm sure you can find two of them wearing t-shirts like that that don't have anything to do right and it would be you can, you easy can, for you to just find and you could find sorry directly. You could find those exact same people doing stupid things in favor of Hillary. So right. to isolate them and to kind of turn uh, them into avatars right. of your political theory is just—it's just bad methodology. I do understand. It's facile. It's facile. Yes. So, um, so how can we really know what's driving people? It sounds like five thirty-eight came up with something that at least makes sense, sense as a methodology, which is let's correlate a shift in uh, support from Obama in 08 and 12 to Trump this year, 
with uh, the economic, economic fortunes of different parts of the country. And correlation isn't causality, but at least now it sounds like this is something that that makes sense and bears some more examination. Oh, the places that shifted most to Trump uh, did actually experience the biggest economic downturns in the last four and eight years. That seems to make more sense than there was this epidemic of racism that suddenly infected these areas where they were free of it or largely free of it before. That that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So yeah, I think all of us have to, um, the best defense against confirmation bias uh, and other uh, forms of bias that can that can make you come up with the wrong results is initially just to be aware of it. When you're doing it, take a step back and say, hey, you know, could I do this in any direction I want? Could I do it to prove things about Hillary or to prove any other political theories? I mean, finding a sample size of two people out of 60 million, come on. Yeah, I mean, that's a chronic problem with the, you know, in these elite circles, there's such a lack of self-awareness. Um, you know, we ha you had total unanimity, and this is what's so amazing about this, about the scope and the, and the and the meaning of Hillary's defeat. You had total unanimity in well, in, in the media, in well, in elite sort of finance, uh, finance, in this in celebrity culture. I mean, yeah, you had some fringe people who were for Trump, but I mean, for the most part, in the in, in the forces that dictate dominant cultural life in this right. country. There was ninety nine point nine percent unanimity, if not in favor of Hillary, against Trump. Right. And still, I mean, so you would think that a self aware journalist who's, who's immersed in one of those spheres would say to themselves, "You know what? I'm a member of a social cohort that probably isn't reflective of the wider country at large. So therefore, I have to take steps to right. remediate that confirmation bias." Right. But they don't. They don't. They don't think of themselves as having confirmation bias. And you know, I think a big problem here, and I, I want to be curious to hear what you got, um, think about this. Is I think a lot of this stems from the media culture industry being concentrated in a few select geographic locales Makes or sense. enclaves. So you have New York, Los Angeles, Washington, San Francisco, and that you know, and then maybe a, a little bit in Austin and a little bit in Chicago, but that's about it, right? In terms right. of where cultural culture is generated in this country, so like right now, I'm in Montgomery, Alabama. There's nobody in national media who's based in Montgomery, Alabama. There's nobody can, like, who can like personally and directly reflect the views of people in Montgomery, Alabama, yeah. and inject it into the dominant media yeah. discourse. So, I mean, that's just a basic practical reason why I think you have this groupthink and this confirmation bias develop because we've, we, we've you know, not, notwithstanding the, the internet, which should theoretically make it possible for people to do this kind of thing from anywhere, there's this natural cloistering effect that's happened and has sort of walled, you know, our, 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 our elite media class off from the rest of the country, which is why they were so utterly shocked that this could have happened. I think that makes perfect sense, and I have a question for you in that regard because I'm I'm often curious about what it's like um, to be in a position where you're really you've gone against the the conventional wisdom you've taken an iconoclastic stand, and um, that interests me on a number of levels, including just the one of being a novelist and trying to imagine things from other people's perspective. But having followed your reporting on the election for, I don't know, at least the last, I think it's been at least the last year. I mean, you've made so much sense throughout this thing and particularly in retrospect, you were right, not about everything, but about so much about the important things that I wonder now, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts, like what did it feel like to be saying these things that, the biggest big shots in establishment media were treating as though they were apostasy or insanity or um, just just something that um, you can't even take it seriously. It's just it's just this guy who's talking out his ass and, and doesn't have a clue. And and yet you never wavered. I mean, at least not in public. At least not from what I was reading. You're like, look, um, just one quick example. You've been talking about the fact that um, that. Hillary Clinton has been under active criminal investigation by the FBI for what, like a year? It's like basically since this whole thing got started, right? And again and again, you've been saying, do you think this could pose any sort of vulnerability in, say, the general election, like if it blows up in any way? And, um, and people just didn't seem to take it seriously. And so, I don't know, it's just someone who, um, who tries to follow um, smart people whose methodology makes sense and who get things right instead of kind of like dumb talking heads. That really impressed me because I would read that stuff and I'm like, yeah, it makes perfect sense. I mean, 
that really is a vulnerability. Why aren't more people talking about this? And they just wouldn't. Was it ever hard for you to, like, did you ever doubt yourself? Did you ever feel like, is there something wrong with me? Am I missing something that all the, all the cool, smart kids in journalism seem to be, uh, you know, looking at a different way? Well, yeah, first, it's nice of you to put it that way. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's hard. Like, I can kind of disassociate myself from the vitriol that I got on a daily basis and I'm still getting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, none of you, know, you, you put, you, you describe me as an iconoclast, and I guess you know, I'll accept that characterization. But for me, it was always just a sober assessment of the evidence yeah. at hand. That's, um, that's, it's not like, that's fair, by the way. Like, I, I never, I've never read your stuff and thinking like, oh, he's trying, like he's, because this would be useless. It's not like I've ever sensed you're like, oh, this is the conventional wisdom. I'm going to take some sort of opposite tack. Like, these are the yeah. icons. I'm going to smash them. That's not how I meant it. But and that would be, and that would be positions that were contrary just, just because you thought they were right from what I can Right. Say. And that would be contrarianism, right? Like contrarianism yeah. connotes arbitrariness. Like so something is, something is popularly believed. Therefore I'm going to just take the opposite view because it's popularly believed. Right. But no, that's not what I've done. I mean, not at all. Not listen, I mean on the FBI thing, right? That just seemed incredibly obvious all the way through. I mean, and yet, <laughs> And yet, well, that, this is exactly what I'm talking you know, about. You're you know, right. in an iconoclastic position, particularly in retrospect. No. It's just a baseline common sense, like being minimally in touch with reality one. And yet, for all the time, you've been talking about this for like a year and, and very few people were taking it seriously. Did you ever pause and say, am I missing something? Maybe it doesn't really matter if a candidate is under active <laughs> criminal investigation by the FBI. No, because, you know, so let's say Hillary even won, right? So if Hillary had won by a small margin... I, I think I, my analysis still would have been essentially correct. I mean, the FBI still investigation still would have been a liability for her. Yes, um, it still would have fed into this conception of her as untrustworthy and would have damaged her, her favorability numbers. She just would have had to, you know, she just would have been able to put the uh, you know, had the chips fall just so and been able to eke out a victory anyway. So Which I mean, is, by the way, a kind of another another sort of logical fallacy or mindset that we have to be careful about. Like, you can't just judge. Um, <clears throat> whether a game has been well played by the result, for example, or whether the game was smart to begin with. Like I might, I could just play a, a round of Russian roulette right now and the gun doesn't go off. That doesn't mean it was a smart game. and It doesn't mean that I played it well. Could be that you got lucky. So yeah, I would tend to agree with you. If a candidate is under a criminal investigation by the FBI, that's not a good thing. And anyway, recently- but, 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 you know, I mean, the reason why so many people were dismissive of it because there was a successful effort on the part of the Hillary or the Clinton apparatus yeah. To deny that it was even it, it even existed, yeah. first you know, it was called a security review, and it was called an inquiry, and it was called anything but a criminal investigation. And even to this very day, there are people who deny that it was a criminal investigation. When you can look at the FBI's own documents, which state yes. that it was a criminal investigation, and that yes. Hillary Clinton personally was being investigated to determine whether she had committed felony violations, yes, okay? Yes, yes. Um, and, and, as well as her top aides. So, I mean, this wasn't like, I mean, first of all, a lot of these pundits don't have any kind of legal training whatsoever. And I've never been a practicing lawyer, but I, I've studied law. I, I know how criminal procedure works. I know a little bit. You, know, you don't have to be a lawyer. Look at what Marcy Wheeler does. She doesn't have a law degree. You'd never know it from her reporting. You, you know. You right. I mean, so I mean, this stuff is this. This stuff was never hard to grok for me. I mean, um, that's. I think because you weren't actively, emotionally, or otherwise motivated to minimize it, downplay it, whatever. You just were like, you just read the documents. You saw what the FBI is doing, and I think you did one other thing, which is a really, really important exercise for everybody, but maybe especially for journalists. I don't remember when I saw this uh, tweet you wrote, or maybe it was something on Medium, but whatever. <clears throat> You said, how would people re be reacting if the very same FBI, oh, let's call it a security review, were being done not with regard to Hillary Clinton, but with regard to Donald Trump? In other words, Donald Trump was this, would, is the source of this FBI. So if, if, just to put, it, you know, put a fine point on it, if Trump had been the one under investigation for, I think at the time of that tweet, it was like nine months, yeah. right? So yes. that would have been blown up. Of course. Of Yo, course, and they wouldn't have been calling it a security review. They would have been calling it, suddenly the people who, you, you're being kind to them, you're like, well, they're not lawyers. I'm like, all those people with no legal training, but who really, really were motivated um, to see 
Clinton win the election and to see Trump lose, all of them would have instantly understood that this is in fact a criminal investigation, but it, only because it was being, a, because only because the candidate under the investigation was the one they wanted to see lose. So you've you got to be careful about taking a position with regard to one candidate if you're not willing to take it or, or with regard to another or flip it in a more positive say like look the things i'm saying in praise of um my candidate now would they apply if the very same fact pattern applied to the other candidate no well maybe there's something wrong with the principle i'm trying to articulate there's not nearly enough of that in journalism and you know you know one of the i mean there are so many amazing uh, uh ironies of this election cycle to kind of chronicle but one that stands out is so just yesterday this memo came out, or uh, or Hillary was on a, on a conference call with her donors, like kind of explaining why she lost, <laughs> which has got to be the most, uh, yeah, you know, that's, imagine that's just, be tough. imagine doing that call, right? Yeah. Um, this is where she blamed Comey. She blamed Je she blamed James Comey for the for the results. So she blamed her email issue for why she lost. Yeah. Okay, so let's just, just pause. How for how long since March? So the email issue was first. Broken. Right. I mean, it was first reported by the New York Times in March of 2015. There was a ferocious effort by Media Matters and by Think Progress and by all these sort of interrelated entities that yeah. were behind Hillary, the, you know, yeah. sort of the Washington, D.C. DC establishment Democrat apparatus, right. to, to characterize the email issue as a nothing burger. I mean, that was the sort of juvenile term they coined for right. it. Um, and they would be offended if you would bring it up as a potential liability for her. They would accuse you of being in cahoots with the right wing to take down Hillary if you yes. mentioned it. Not even, you know, so I happen to think, and I've always thought that on the substance there was some merit to the issue. But even just uh, bracketing the substance, right. purely as a political issue, of course it was going to matter for her, just her just her prospects of winning. Um, of and now, I mean, fast forward... Hillary herself now says that it was it was it was momentous enough of an issue that it had sunk literally sunk her candidacy yeah. and allowed the guy from The Apprentice to win. I mean, how amazing of an irony is that? Wow. Yes, that's right. And the the notion that Comey <clears throat> cost her the election with that. Um, uh, the news, what was it? It was a week and a half. It was a Friday, like 10 days before election. It was October, day October 28th is when the news broke of the investigation having resumed. Right. And then the second letter came on November 6th, so the right. Sunday before the election. Right. Saying that, you know, they had reviewed all the emails. And right, right, right. Which, and, and there's some, there's speculation, um, not without uh, merit, I think, that the second letter was at best irrelevant and might even have just caused more damage because it just keeps this notion of like something sleazy involving emails in in the public eye uh, for it keeps that issue in the public eye for even longer. But it's not to say that look, we can we can come up with thought experiments where Comey didn't uh, release that news on October 28th, say it just uh, stayed to sleep or Chris Hayes. Um, had an, just an interesting question uh, on Twitter a couple of days ago where he said, well, it's just, it's kind of interesting to speculate what would have happened if the Access Hollywood tape, the grab, or, grab him by the pussy revelations about Trump had happened on October 28th and the uh, FBI uh, reopening its investigation, reactivating its investigation had happened whenever that was like October 10th or something when the Access Hollywood tape, like just flip the timeline. Uh, so that one becomes stale and the other one happens right on the eve of the election, would that have flipped the results of the election? And my response to that is, I, I think if Chris were here, he'd probably agree. We'll never know. Maybe. It's kind of an interesting question. But these are, for me, not the most relevant things because there's not that much to be learned from them. As, as you've been pointing out for over a year now, the FBI has been investigating Clinton. And that means that something like this could happen. And that means that the Democratic base and the establishment, democratic establishment should have taken the this sort of vulnerability into account in choosing the candidate but for whatever reason they didn't want to the fact that comey might have done what he did was as foreseeable as let's say rain during a football game to go back to my earlier analogy so if you take the field and you didn't outfit your team i don't know why i'm coming up with sports analogies because sports is really not my thing but regardless you didn't give your team i don't know like proper cleats or something like that so now they're slipping on the wet grass and they're not playing very well i, I wouldn't know what to say if you said look the reason we lost the game is it rained 
I would say, did you not know that sometimes it rains during football games? Is that not, is that just an entirely new phenomenon for you? And it didn't occur to you that you had to take it into account in some way before playing the game. It's not like an asteroid hit the football field. It rained. Um, if there had been no evidence at all, no inkling that the FBI was ever going to investigate Clinton and that it came up at the end of the process, there'd be a little bit of a better argument. Hey, nobody could have known. But again, as you've been saying for over a year, the FBI has been investigating Clinton for, for all this time. It was a known vulnerability. It's just that people didn't want to admit that it was one. Yeah, and you know, the, this instinct to blame the FBI or to bl uh, blame Vladimir Putin or to blame Jill Stein or Bernie Sanders or any of the other blame. I mean, so let's say that they've said all in the Clinton camp, you know, the former Clinton campaign now, or I get, you know, it still exists as a legal entity because they have to retire all their debt and everything. Yeah. It'll, it'll exist for like another two years or something like that probably. But um, so that's where they settle on the, on the FBI is what really did them in. So James Comey is this big villain and he'll, he'll go down in history as the, um, the guy who elected Trump, right? According to them. So that's another excuse. It's sort of like the popular vote thing. It's something they can point to, to deflect from their, the, the structural reasons why, this failure happened. So yeah. that it's another reason why I have no confidence that anything is going to be fundamentally reevaluated because there's so there's all these extraneous factors that they think they can point to, yeah. other than their own cul personal culpability and other than yeah. her own failings. So it's yeah. you know Putin had Putin was involved and you know, you know the whole list. So um, yeah. I, I have and and they're so unself aware to begin with, yes. and they're so un, un unwilling to to take. I'm willing to question their premises. Um, that I don't think there's any. I, I'm not confident in the slightest that anything is going to change, which What's, is a, which is depressing. I yeah. Right now, I feel the same way. I'm trying to find a little bit of hope in the knowledge that uh, look, the debacle just happened uh, five days ago. So, so the hurt and the shock and the the understandable defensive reaction, all that stuff is. It's got a really fresh impetus right now um maybe with the passage of time it'll um now nah, i'm probably just being overly optimistic i think what's going to make the difference is just i hope what will happen is some people will wake up they'll see that um that video of Keith Ellison in July 2015 on what I don't even know what these shows are because the truth is I never watch them but it's it's one of those talking heads meet the press kind of so, shows uh, this, George, the, this week with George Stephanopoulos yeah, with George Stephanopoulos and you know which one I'm talking about Keith Ellison says we need to do this and this and this because um, Trump is picking up a lot of strength and this guy could be the Republican nominee and watching these stuffed shirts million who are paid millions of dollars to opine about politics, uh, paid millions of dollars for the accuracy of their insights. They laughed at him like he was absolutely, like it was absurd, like they were, they had just such a good laugh at how silly Keith Ellison was to say something as uh, outrageous and absurd as that. So I'm hopeful that, I've tweeted that, um, that a link to that video a couple times because I want people to see it, to know like this is, these are, there are people you should, trust and there are people who you shouldn't trust for uh, not in a sense of like they're honest or dishonest although that could be part of it just but just in terms of like you should have confidence in them or not and by the way i, r I really am trying not to be too hard on anyone for getting something wrong everybody gets stuff wrong all of us it's not a fatal mistake to me the fatal mistake is when you refuse to honestly engage with what you got wrong and how you got it wrong and 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 when you refuse to discuss how you're going to do things going forward. Uh, what's the purpose of making a mistake if you refuse to learn from it? If, you, if you're going to learn from it, then you can become a, even better at whatever it is that you do. But yeah, um, blaming everything else and refusing to honestly grapple with what you got wrong, what you could have done better, and how you would do things differently, <clears throat> that's a real problem uh, going forward. Yeah, one reason why people, so many people look so foolish is because there's, a, there's this obsession in the punditocracy with making predictions. Yes, yes. Um, so true. So, I mean, I don't know why everybody is fixated on making your predict. I mean, and, and people were obsessed with making predictions six months ago, a year ago, a year and a half ago for something that, I mean, that's why I never came out and made any ironclad predictions. I always said that. I always said that I thought that Trump's odds of victory were about 20% higher than the pundit consensus. So 
if you look at Nate Silver's um, uh, you know, final projection, it was something right. like he put it at 31% Trump's odds of victory. Mm. So then my little adjustment to, to that was tw plus 20, right? So right. that put Trump at 51%. Right. So it was roughly accurate. Right. Um, and I thought that was always the case. And that was always the most fruitful way to go about it rather than being bound to these stupid, rash predictions that now people have blown up in people's faces. Um, and... You know, I, I so I didn't I didn't go out on Twitter or on Medium or any of my other kind of outlets and make say Trump is going to win or Trump is going to win X number of electoral votes because I I don't think it's a sort of it's a worthwhile exercise. But totally you know, agree. in my private life, in talking to my brother and like a couple of close friends, but I right. did say, hey, Trump is going to win. You better watch out. Right. So I mean, they can all they can all verify that if you want to go to them and fact check them. So I did that was my view. But like, there's what is this compulsion with like constantly making predictions? So I mean, why not go, yeah. go report on what's happening in the country or go do some analysis? I mean, right. sitting on sitting on your computer and refreshing 538 in the upshot of the New York Times every 20 minutes. Right. What does that get you? So there are, that's such an interesting point, and there are so many things that flow from it. First, you're right. What's, what's the value? I mean, the, the amount of prediction journalism, if you want to call it that, relative to the value of that kind of exercise is it's just completely out of sync. It has very little, if any value. So that's, that's one thing, but there's another thing too. And we're talking about, it's almost a kind of self-defense. Like you have to defend against certain human tendencies, which, which can take you in the wrong direction. So we talked about confirmation bias on the one hand and, uh, and a refusal to apply to what you come up with a principle, but you only apply it in one direction. You don't, at least even not in the theoretical way, you won't apply it to the other candidate to see if it's sound. That's another danger. And here's yet another. When you make any sort of ironclad prediction in politics, you are psychologically now and inve emotionally invested in making sure that this prediction comes true because you have that's, a sense that's, that's, that's true. You've and that is, and that's, that's, that, that's, that, you know, that's guaranteed to distort exactly. your analytical framework. Exactly. And so if you don't want, if you don't want, that sort of distortion to creep into your reporting, you've got to defend yourself earlier on. And the way to do that is to stop acting like you really know. So there's um, Jonathan Chait uh, uh, wrote an article on, it was on actually election day, November 7th. It's getting tweeted today. I came across it. And what he said was, it's this is really telling actually. He said, <clears throat> no, Trump isn't going, I don't remember the exact words, but this is the gist. No, Trump will not win Michigan. And I'm personally offended that anyone would say otherwise. Yeah, so this was a, this was a tweet. This, I, I, this was a tweet of his on November 7th. Um, I, I, can, I might be wrong. I think there was an underlying article. I, I, mean, I, 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 I screenshotted a tweet last night. I made sure I got it because it's there. You know, he put out a tweet on November 7th. So the day before election day, you know, saying, um, Trump is not going to win Michigan. So he just made that declarative statement and said he was offended that anybody would suggest otherwise. So, yeah, so there are two things that are interesting about that. One is that... Look, what's the value of making that definitive prediction about what's going to happen tomorrow? I don't know. It seems like it would have very little value to me. What's the danger is that, it, as we've been saying, it's, it locks you into proving that you were right. But the most interesting thing about it, from my standpoint, was that he tied the notion that other people might not agree with him into a feeling of personal offense. And this is exactly what I'm talking about. There's no reason. Like, I'm, no, I'm not a Jonathan Chait fan. Uh, but he's just an example. He's not really the point. You don't want. He's like the ultimate awesome example of it, though. He's he's, I mean, he's, he's a perfect he's a, of it. He's a good example. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you feel personally offended when someone doesn't agree with your prediction. That's crazy. That's. It's crazy, but it's also dangerous for you as a journalist. Have right, so, so, and just, so just to piggyback on that point, in my, in my analysis that Trump had, a, had greater odds than was popularly assumed, hmm. I mean, that was taken as some sort of moral indictment against me personally. I know. It wasn't taken as my honest assessment of the facts yeah. or the data. Yeah. It was taken as like this stealth desire that I harbored to see Trump win. I know. A conclusion that I arrived to based on reasoning that I could lay out for you explain. I don't think anyone has taken... There's a conflation with like moral, uh, with, with, you know, with uh, you know, moral fiber um, yes. and your, your sort of dispassionate evaluation of 
Fast. Yeah, every every journalist I'm aware of, maybe there are some exceptions, but I doubt it. Everyone I'm aware of who's been dispassionately assessing the relative strengths and weaknesses of the candidates in this election, if you didn't take a really strong position for Hillary, I know you'll be, I know you were attacked for it. It's I, I'm just a novelist. I mean, I'm, I'm a, I think of myself as an activist and I blog about politics and I include them in my novels, but I'm certainly no full-time journalist. Nonetheless, I took a lot of heat for the same sort of thing, including from uh, a good friend who's a journalist in New York who wrote to me because I posted an article on Facebook, just a link to an article in Newsweek. And the article was basically an explanation of like, hey, maybe the reason that millennials aren't so crazy about Hillary Clinton is because they don't think, they don't like her record and rhetoric uh, of warmongering and they think of her as a neoliberal. So, so that's by Emmett, Emmett Renson, who yeah, I've had actually on this. He's done show. a really good job in this election, right? So all I did was tweet a link to the article and say, um, you know, this is worth considering, which I think it very much is. And um, my friend wrote to me and he said, uh, he was angry. He said, Clinton is the only fire engine we've got and you're slashing the tires. And I said, so we just have, he said, stop attacking her. And I said, look, there are so many things that uh, I'm aware that we look at this in a different way. Number one, I don't feel like reporting on a candidate is an attack if there's anything to the reporting. I mean, if it's, it's one thing if it's some sort of slander or something like that. But I don't even think of it as an attack to point out a theory, which you might not agree with, and that's fine, for why millennials are at best lukewarm, um, seemingly lukewarm about Hillary Clinton, one. And two, your analogy about the fire engine is very strange to me because that sounds like I'm sabotaging something, right? But, but I feel like I'm just describing it. I'm not slashing the tires. I'm just pointing to them and saying, uh, it looks like those tires are flat. Is this thing going to work? And in his mind, that was slashing the tires. So again, that's like that's very interesting to me and a good a good example of what you were just talking about. Whereas if you describe something and you think you're doing it in just a descriptive way, a lot of people will say, "But that's going to hurt the candidate. You're not supposed to talk about those things." If this were a medical context, it would almost be like like if a doctor told me, "Barry, I've got some bad news." you've got metastatic cancer, it would be like me saying, don't, don't say that, you'll cause cancer. And it's like, dude, I'm not giving you the cancer. I'm just telling you what the x-ray shows, <laughs> okay? That's, it's not a perfect analogy, but that tends to be more the way I feel about uh, politics and reporting. And yet there are a lot of people who, who really feel that if you report on something, you're causing it, which is probably not a good framework for doing effective adversarial journalism and holding the powerful to account. And by the way, in 2012, a lot of conservative journalists did the exact same thing, but on, in favor of Romney, right? So yeah. Trump didn't have support from, from conservative journalists this time. And at, at the very best, they were lukewarm about him, if not, oh, yeah. no, most yeah. were outright opposed. National Review and the Wall Street Journal. Right. So all that crowd, I mean, they were, they were, they were full on for Romney in 2012, right? Um, and you can go back, and I chronicled it at the time, they would do the same thing, where they would do this thing called wish casting. So their wish was for Romney to win. Right. They would therefore assemble data and interpret it through the lens. Hmm. Oh, I think... Uh... I, I don't know if you can still hear me, Michael, but um, I think I, I don't just, know. Oh, something's going on. I love you were saying through the lens. Yeah, can you hear me? Now? You can hear me now. Yes. Okay. So um, in 2012, these conservative journalists interpreted data through the lens of their wish for right. Romney to prevail. So it was wish casting. Right. And now, four years later, you have a perfect analog. Now, the data is a little, I mean, the empirical polling data was a little more stacked against Romney four years ago. Right. But still, it's this under, uh, underlying desire to portray things through a particular frame because you're trying to will your preferred candidate to victory rather than right. doing a dispassionate assessment of the facts right. and the evidence. So you had even like this guy, Jamel Bowie, who was this... A much touted commentator analysis. Yeah. You, know, you know what I'm talking about? I think so. He's with MSNBC, I think. I mean, he might appear on the... I, I'm not sure. It's uh, Jay Bowie on Twitter. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, but he, I mean, you know, he's a smart guy. I mean, I don't agree with him on a lot, but he's not He's not unintelligent. Right. Um, but even he, you'd have... You know, I, I went back and looked at his timeline, right, the day before the election, or maybe it was even the day of, and he put out one, like, you know, you could fill in your own electoral map, and he predicted that 
Hillary was going to be was going to win Nebraska's second congressional district, mm. which was just so absurd. And 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 he had her winning an electoral college blowout. I mean, he had her winning North Carolina, even though polling at that point showed Trump either ahead in North Carolina or darn close to ahead. And there was another tweet that he did a couple of days prior, like when you know this big kind of shocking poll came out that showed Trump t seven points ahead in North Carolina. Yeah, You had the people like Jamel Bowie and Boot Whitler and Shade all saying, no, 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 don't be silly. Look at these early voting numbers. Look at all these other factors that prove it can't possibly be the case that yeah. Trump is ahead in North Carolina. Well, I mean, he didn't win. Trump didn't win by seven points, but he won by 3.2 points. Yeah. So that poll was accurate within a margin of error. Yeah. Um, so they were doing their, I mean, so four years ago, they, all these same people would mock the pro Romney pundits for trying to unskew the polls. Yeah. But it for, first of all, it turned out, you know, first of all, by unskewing a poll, you're acknowledging that there's always going to be some polling error. Yeah. So there was a polling error in 2012, but it was in Obama's favor. Right. So Obama under overperformed relative to the polls in 2012, but this time Trump overperformed relative to the polls. Right. Um, so unskewing is in itself wrong, but you, uh, some people can take it out, take it too far, and like and put like a conspiratorial conspiratorial gloss on it. Right. Um, but you know, even, even the same people who said that uns unskewing the polls is the, the most ridiculous, pitiful exercise, they were doing. They ended up doing it themselves this time because data came at them that contradicted their assumptions about yeah. the race. So it's. I mean, that's another amazing irony. Um, but you know, something I want to ask you is: so I, I've now embarked on this little, what I'm calling sort of half tongue in cheek. A, a pundit accountability initiative, mm -hmm. or like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the pundits. I, I, I read your post on, I think it was Medium today, where you talked about what you got right and what you got wrong. And I, I, I would love to. See, unfortunately, you're only going to see that sort of thing from people who got more right than they got wrong. But it's a good start. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I mean, and um, yeah, that was on Medium, and that's where I'm going to post posting a lot of my stuff now because uh, Vice just severed its ties with me, as you know. But that's let's yeah. not dwell on that. Yeah. Um, although I stand by totally what I did, um, in that I revealed Lena Dunham, a multimillionaire Clinton surrogate, had deceived the public about her actions. Um, so it wasn't just if like... you want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. Oh, you just cut, damn it. Oh, sorry, I, I, I muted myself by accident. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Um, but the, the reason why I, what I wanted to ask you is, you know, so hundred account kind of believe I've been sort of sharp about it. I've been a little confrontational about it because nobody else is going to do it. So sure. I mean, I might as well do it. Um, I mean, what do you think would be the best way to sort of carry out an endeavor like that? I mean, is there a way to do it, acknowledging the psychological toll it'll take on people, so, like it's really interesting not letting not, not letting them off the hook, but at the same time demanding that they be held accountable? It's a great question. I don't see how it can be done without naming the people who got certain things really wrong, right? I mean, that's just gonna have to be part of it um, unless those people were stepping forward. Like I, I might've missed this. I don't follow Jonathan Chait, but maybe sometime since November 7th, he's written a whole, a new think piece about why he was so disastrously wrong about how it was gonna go in Michigan, what he's learned from it and how that's gonna make him a better journalist going forward. Um, if he's done that, then respect. I haven't seen it. Um, but even if he has, he's only one example. Most people aren't going to do it. Most people are going to say it was Comey, it was it was Bernie, it was anyone who voted for a third party, et cetera. Um, so, so I think someone, I'm really glad you're doing this, has to lay out as comprehensively as possible what you see as um, as the failings of the establishment media in this election. Because by the way, like I think the, the most fruitful inquiries regard, was this the right candidate and, and was this the right campaign? But to the extent that journalism, that journalists are responsible for the result of this election, I think it's, um, it's really a mistake to point the finger at uh, anyone who was critical of Hillary Clinton. I think <clears throat> it's probably much more useful to, um, to try to figure out why journalists, why establishment journalists might not be as trusted anymore um, as maybe they once were, <clears throat> why people have turned off to them. That might have a, a significant impact on why 
someone like Trump, a demagogue and a, a con man, a fraud like Trump, could actually become president of the United States. And, and by the way, like we talked about Chris Hayes a little while ago. I know on Twitter the other day you mentioned his book, um, Twilight of the Elites, which came out, I think, at least two years ago, right? Roughly. This was in, it came out in 2012. It was a great, great and prescient book. It's a fantastic book, uh, Twilight of the Elites. Anyone who's listening, I highly recommend it. And and uh, like basically what he does is he sort of, I mean, and I, I want to get your kind of nutshell version out of it. And I want to come back to your question because it's so important. But yeah, keep going. Yeah, but, but just, just very briefly, I mean, what he does is he kind of goes around to these different institutions that are kind of central to American life yeah. and documents with reporting and analysis how they sort of collectively just failed right and they lost legitimacy in the eyes of the right. public right so that's why it's twilight of the elites is that the elites have been basically discredited yeah. and that paved the way for exactly. for trump and directly exactly. yeah. and and to be clear like and this so this ties into the question just ask like how do we hold people to account what um what i think erodes people's confidence in leaders in elites the establishment whatever isn't when leaders get things wrong it's when leaders, or the establishment of the elite, or whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> get things wrong and then refuse to hold themselves to account, refuse to honestly grapple with their responsibility, and don't come up with any, and don't derive any lessons that they can articulate for why and how they're going to do better next time. I think humans are pretty forgiving of mistakes generally, as long as the mistake is accompanied with an acknowledgement, if not an outright apology. <clears throat> along with an explanation for how the person got things wrong and why next time they're going to do better. It's, it's that second failure, I think, even far more than the first, that has hollowed out the ability of uh, elite journalists to have the kind, of the kind of impact they once did on public opinion. I mean, one thing that's fascinating about this election, it doesn't matter what you think of Trump. It's not even relevant to this point. I don't see how anyone can argue other than America's establishment journalists, celebrities, politicians, <clears throat> through everything it had at this guy, with an assist from the candidate, lots of assists from the candidate. Yeah, so you had the Atlantic issuing an endorsement for the first time since um, yes. Lyndon Johnson had only done, done so one uh, previous time. for the protection of journalists. Yeah. USA Today magazine. issued an endorsement for the first time. Vogue, all these other magazines that were never politicized. They also, exactly. okay, we have, to get, we have to get on the right side of history here and oppose Trump. Not to, not to mention substantial segments of the Republican establishment coming out either against Trump or actually for Clinton. I mean, look how neocon, how many neocons like Max Boot have been, um, <clears throat> have been campaigning for her at least online. And although I don't, I've never thought it was much of a stretch for a neocon to support Clinton. I've never really understood the hostility because on foreign policy, there's uh, there's a pretty substantial alignment. But the point is a year ago, if you had asked almost anyone, including me, I mean, it's, uh, I haven't been talking about the things I got wrong, but sure, I'm, plenty of things <clears throat> in the course of this election. Uh, but one of them is this, if you'd asked me a year ago, if you'd said, Barry, do you think a Republican candidate can win after calling Mexicans rapists and after a tape comes out where he says, oh, I like to grab women by the pussy, and then 13 women came out and corroborated his account, and all these um, Republican and right-wing uh, publications and politicians either refused to endorse him or unendorsed him or wrote op-eds against him, and basically the entire establishment pointed out that this guy was going to be a disaster for America and the world. Do you think he's got any chance of winning? I absolutely would have said, Hell no. I mean, any one of those things would be fatal for a candidate. That's what I believed. Yeah, and, and you know, I think I think this is going to be the equivalent of the Iraq War or the financial crisis for the media industry. I hope. Um, because it's such a collective failure. If, if anything, the, the failure is even more collective and more pronounced than those previous occurrences but, because but, yeah. you know, because because uh, and here's why because you know yeah. you mentioned up so you mentioned so how could trump eat when even when you have the grab by the pussy thing and you have all these other you know his um his obvious disqualif right. disqualifications it's because the, the the way that the media approached trump was counterproductive and it made so many people tune out the media because it was always a constant avalanche of trump Hysteria. I mean, I tried to make this point, right? But when you have every single day another Trump, trumped up Trump controversy, yeah. At a certain point, people can only process so much, right? So, so they're gonna they're gonna, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna assume that there's a bad faith behind it or there's a cynicism behind it. Yeah. So when something does come along that is worthy of their outrage, <laughs> they're gonna 
they're not going to have any, anything left in their right. outrage reservoir. Right. 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 You've exhausted their capacity. So, okay. So this is one thing <clears throat> that um, I think I could successfully advise a political campaign on as a novelist. Narrative is kind of my thing, right? So what we're talking about here is narrative. You can't just, you can't just, uh, you don't create a good story, and we're all attuned to story. It's just part of human nature. You can't create a compelling story with what, what what's called in the trade uh, just episodes, episodic storytelling. It would just be like this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. But there's no there's no narrative arc. There's no framework. <clears throat> there's no um, change in the character's position, persona throughout the course of the story. It's just a bunch of strung together incidents, and that's boring. It's not compelling, and people don't want to read that story. They sort of they tune it out. And you could argue that. <clears throat> not just journalists, but uh, in this case, particularly the, the Clinton campaign itself made a huge mistake in this regard. They never really came up with a compelling narrative, and in part, I think, because they couldn't, to explain <clears throat> why Clinton should be the nominee and, and why Trump was wrong for it. There was a lot about unfit, but that itself was not a narrative that they could, through, into which they could slot all Trump's shortcomings. Here's a quick example of something I think on a tactical level the Trump campaign did well. And sure, this is Monday morning quarterbacking, although I was talking about this before, um, before election day for what it's worth. <clears throat> The Trump campaign had two overarching messages. One was negative about Clinton and one was positive about himself. The negative message about Clinton was that she's corrupt. That's pretty much it. As a as a debranding exercise, you can very quickly and neatly and compellingly sum up the way the Trump campaign tried to brand Clinton in a negative way. She's corrupt. And they got some things behind that. He called her crooked Hillary. That's fourth grade stuff. It's not my style. But was it effective? Probably was. Because it's totally congruent with their overarching branding exercise for Clinton. She's corrupt. Crooked Hillary. And then it turns into, uh, into this crazy burn the witch. Again, not my thing, but whatever. This is working with his mass crowds. That mass chanting, lock her up. Was it ugly? It and, did, and it works. It did work because at, at eventually she became, she and Trump became equally disliked in the public. And there were even some which, pollings that suggested that she was less, viewed less favorably than Trump by the end right. of the campaign. This is, this is, um, um, Heather Parton Digby tweeted about this earlier today, where that kind of toxic, mutually toxic campaign probably favors a guy like Trump because uh, Hillary supporters probably have a, um, have a, are, are more easily nauseated and turned off than Trump's. And I think there's probably a yeah, lot. Because if, if, if there's so much all-consuming mutual hostility and everybody right. is just fed up and sick and tired of the race on right. both sides... Right, and, and the candidate with the most enthusiastic core. Exactly. So that's sort of a true. We're going to turn out no matter what. Yeah. Right. Would favor Trump, and I think I think there's a lot to that. So so on the one hand, there's this totally congruent branding narrative that the Trump campaign is articulating. Um, Hillary is corrupt. Crooked Hillary, lock her up. The positive side, again, fourth grade level stuff, and it doesn't make any sense at all, but that's not the point. It does tell a story in four words, make America great again. They even are able to reduce it to an acronym, MAGA, and like hashtag MAGA or whatever. So does that make any sense on a logical basis? No, but it doesn't matter because stories don't win on logical appeal. They win on emotional appeal. So for himself, he brands himself as the guy who's going to make America great again. And then a lot of things get slotted into that, how he's going to stand up to, uh, he's going to bomb the shit out of ISIS <clears throat> and he's going to renegotiate trade deals and the Paris um, climate treaty and all this kind of stuff. And that's all in the, in the uh, context of making America great again. So two messages, one negative about the opponent, two branding exercises, one positive about himself. And, 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 and his sub-message is congruent with those two things. And conversely, if you were to ask an ordinary voter, what is Hillary's positive message for her campaign? Everybody knows that she thinks Trump is unfit. I'll, I'll tell you what it Trump is. Trump probably isn't fit. But what is, what is Hillary's message? Nobody still knows. I mean, this is the most amazing thing. This the, is it. the woman it's, has been running for president for literally 10 years. Yeah, yeah. She announced her exploratory committee for her 2008 run in the fall of 2006. Yeah. And you can even make an argument that her and Bill have been running a permanent campaign since the, they were in Arkansas. Okay? Yeah. So... And then on the on the final night, here she is in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was there, um, uh, 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 issuing her final statement on the state of the campaign, right? In Raleigh, and and what what is the last phrase? Like the literally the last phrase she utters in this speech it was at at midnight, or I guess this end up being at two two a.m. or something. She ended her speech in Raleigh on election eve by saying, "Love Trump's hate." So her final rallying call was, the other guy is bad. Yeah, yeah. 
This is somebody who's been in the public eye for decades, yeah. and she still couldn't articulate an affirmative case for why she ought to be president. No. It was uh, amazing. I think the closest her campaign came to articulating that case was in the slogan, it's her turn, and I'm with her. And I think... <clears throat> Even that is, I mean, and I, the, the fact that they selected that slogan, I'm with her, it, it's so, I mean, it's so myopic. I can't, it's, it's so I, indicative of how, <clears throat> of, of the pathologies that undergirded why they failed. And and what they were hoping for. Um, I, so I think what I they were hoping for is I'm with her is because her is female, of course, right? Of course. So they want to say, oh, for first female president, but like. Of course, it would have, if she were, if it were Joe Biden as a nominee saying I'm with him would have just been. Uh, yeah. Just so and, then, and, then, and then Trump, Trump inverted it and said, no, I'm with you. And he made um, that his little kind of counter response hashtag. It's but you know, the, really, the, the really funny, effective. That's nicely the, done. The funny thing is, you know, so when he said I'm with her, that's a hashtag, right? So who tends to use hashtags? Probably more younger people. I think younger women are much less likely to be enthused about the notion of a female president on its own terms. I think I think she Hillary probably did mobilize some older women who did you know, who did want a female president you know, just for that reason alone, and they might, they might have also supported Hillary for you know additional reasons. But you know, in talking to younger women, I, I don't find very many who are you know. Um, you know, bowled over by the prospect of a female president yeah. just for I that. Don't, I don't really know, but what I do know is that in the end, um, how many women who voted voted for Hillary? And I, I think it's like 53% total or something, a little over half, 56% maybe. She definitely underperformed among women relative to what they thought they were going to do. Yeah. So, uh, so I think America, even the world, but let's focus on America because that's where the election happened, is clearly in some kind of uh, exceptionally insurgent mood right now. And into that market, uh, Trump introduced an insurgent message. And into that market, the Democratic establishment and people who thought that Clinton was the right candidate introduced an establishment candidate. Here's a quick, a quick uh, thought exercise. Name a Democratic candidate who would be more of an insider and more of an, of an establishment candidate than Hillary Clinton. You can't. Even Joe yeah. Biden, He's who's the, the closest, vice pre the yeah, but, closest but, you can come up with. Yeah, I mean, but even he, I mean, he's not the embodiment of decades Agreed. of what's gone wrong in Agreed. the country. No, I mean, the, so closest, the closest you could come up with would probably be Biden. So yeah, but, really, but the thing, even he wouldn't, doesn't rise to that level, and he's the incumbent vice president, which is yeah, itself it's hilarious. It's an amazing thing. You're right. So... So again, I don't mean this as a kind of criticism, and maybe I'm wrong, but my intention is just to describe what I see as reality. Into this insurgent market, the Democrats chose as their nominee the most establishment candidate alive. That's tough. You've you've now created a really tough sales job for yourself. Um, and, you know, and, 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 and that's why I'm doing this pundit accountability thing, right? Because, you know, it wasn't a mystery that Hillary was this embodiment of estab the establishment back in, say, 2013 or 14 or 15 right. when the so-called invisible primary was happening and all these sort of influencers and operatives and other actors within the Democratic Party coalition decided that they were all going to get behind Hillary. Right. So, I mean, that's why you need accountability to say, hey, you knew this was going to be a problem and you right. did it anyway. Right. So, so to come back to that incredibly important thing you're grappling with right now, like how do you create this sort of accountability? I don't know. It's a tough call. What I do on a personal level is I, I try to make people not feel unnecessarily defensive, but they're already going to be defensive because these are, again, people who yeah, are but When you're saying, hey, you failed at your job, like the one job you had for two years straight. I mean, uh, it's, there's, no, there's no way to make that point without provoking defensiveness. So, so all I could say is like, it's tough. Maybe it's, it's harder to do this in an article. When I do this, anytime I've had to do something like this in my life, I try to use the golden rule. Like when I screw up, how do I like it when, I, when people criticize me? And then I try to do that in reverse. That's a pretty good rule of thumb. So what I try to say is not like you screwed up or anything like that. What I try for is just, okay, so this didn't go the way we had hoped it would. Is there anything that we would do differently based on what we know now and that we might be able to do differently next time? That's the way I try to phrase it to get people more comfortable, but 
You know, it's it, it, the thing is, it's it's inherently confrontational. My my tactic is to try to be as good natured as possible about, about it. So you don't have to call anybody a moron. You don't have to be oh. you know excessively rhetorically harsh. No, and so you want to be direct. That, you want to be direct and clear, and that's what I'm trying to do. But, the, but even that's going to be interpreted as as confrontation. Right, so right. it's almost. And, but there's another reason not to break out the you know, hey, you're a moron kind of. Not even just verbally, but even in terms of our own attitudes. It's again a form of self-defense. When you when you insult someone, you have now taken a position, an implicit position on your own superiority, moral superiority, intellectual superiority, whatever it is that's behind the insult. And and it is very you've now made it difficult for yourself, far more difficult than than necessary or useful for you to change your mind or change your position because your ego is invested. So I try to engage people as though, even if in my heart I don't believe it, but as though there's a substantial possibility that I'm wrong. And sometimes I surprise myself by actually being wrong. And when that happens uh, in an exchange in which I haven't insulted anyone, it's so much easier for me to say, wow, that's a really good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that, thank you. It's easy, but if I go in there saying, what are you, stupid? Don't you know anything? And then they're like, they, they recite some facts back that I didn't know. Now nah, it's hard. I'm embarrassed. I feel like I was a fool, and I'm and psychologically, I'm looking for ways to prove that they're not right, and I'm uh, and I am right. Which is that shouldn't be the purpose of the exercise. The purpose is to keep an open mind and try to get to something as close as possible to the truth. Yeah, and especially in a medium like Twitter, which is inevitably going to be where a lot of this reckoning takes place. I mean, yeah. that's just how things operate nowadays. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to get sucked into the insults. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I it happens to me. I mean, uh, on occasion too. But I have to be try to stay cognizant uh, of not. I mean, even for my own personal stress level, it's not worth it. I mean, you don't want to get into that. <laughs> Twitter, yeah. Twitter is. I love Twitter, obviously. Um, but with a hundred and forty character limit, um, here's what I've discovered about Twitter. I'll give you a quick example, and it was super interesting to me. It's a good learning experience. So Mike Masnick, who's fantastic, if anyone listening, if you read, go tech dirt. Um, Mike is just really sharp on pretty much everything, especially intellectual property issues, but everything is really worth reading. Anyway, so um, once there was, um, I don't even know who it was, I don't follow her, but some, a woman on Twitter was, I think she, she's a novelist or some kind of writer, and she was advising everyone um, never to write for free. You should never write for free, you should only write if somebody's paying you. And Mike responded, he goes, but nobody's paying you to tweet that. You're writing it. Nobody's paying you to tweet that. And um, and she nice. very, very she's nice like, done. yeah. And she's like, listen to this guy mansplaining. And Mike was like, <laughs> Mike is a really nice person. He's like, no, no, I'm not mansplaining. I'm just trying to, you know, show you that what you just said, like you can't, re like that really can't be the principle because you yourself are violating it in the course of articulating. And, and by, by the way, speaking of uncompensated labor, my pundit initiative, uh, uh, pundit accountability initiative is, uh, is also uncompensated. So people, all, all my wonderful viewers and listeners, feel free to go to my GoFundMe. And, um, I did, I did recently. I'm really I know, I, 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 I very much appreciate that. Thank you. I, I appreciate uh, how much I've learned from you. Thank you. So, but when I watched that exchange, it was really interesting to me. And I don't, I don't blame Mike and sort of the nature of the medium, but um, if there had been time and space, and, and Mike had like, let's say he knew this person and like they were friends or something like that. And he really wanted to not make her uh, feel defensive and to get her to listen to what he said. It would have been a very different approach. It would have been something like this. Hey, I understand how you feel. Like I've been screwed by publishers too or lowballed by uh, magazines or whatever. And it really sucks. And it makes me feel like, yeah, you know, I don't want to do, I don't want to write for free. But then if you think about it, sometimes there might be times where there's some sort of other upside, some sort of financial ups, or not non-financial, but some other upside that you're after that might make it worthwhile to write like for some strategic reason that doesn't involve an immediate financial payoff. Even, you know, it occurs to me that we're actually tweeting to each other right now and probably nobody's paying us to do that. So there may be times. And then, you know, like with all that, the person's, uh, the person doesn't feel uh, insulted, but with Twitter, there's no room for that kind of cushioning up front, that that context creation of "Hey, I'm not attacking you," and you don't have much room, so you go directly for the counter example that demolishes the other side's argument, and <laughs> yeah, you know, gets a lot of heat relative to light. That's funny. I mean, the, way, the way I cushion th things sometimes, you know, is, it could be as simple as just adding a smiley face, or a, a, like if you're saying if you, you say something totally vicious to somebody, and then there's a panda smiley face emoticon to it. I mean, that can soften the blow. It's tough. Yeah. Um, I mean, my my <laughs> goal is when I engage people 
anytime, but especially online, which is where I do most, where I probably, where I reach the most people who I'm trying to politically engage. I, I constantly try to remind myself that my goal is to persuade people. I know I've never been persuaded by an insult. I have occasionally been persuaded in spite of being insulted, but that takes a big effort on my part because I'm human. And if I'm trying to persuade someone, I don't want to make them go to the effort. I want to make, you know, I want to make the persuasion as likely as possible. Yeah, so and, and that's, that's my guideline. That, yeah, that's the most gratifying feedback that I get. And I get a lot of feedback now, and I'm very grateful for that. And the, the most gratifying kind of strain of feedback is, hey, you know, I don't necessarily agree with you, but you made me think about things in a different light. Or, really? yeah, you did actually advance an argument that convinced me or, or changed my re my um, my reasoning. Um, yeah. And 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 now now I'm approaching this topic differently. Yeah. Um, so that's always the best. That's always my favorite type of of feedback. And it shows that you know, it is possible. I mean, people kind of like to mock the limitations of Twitter, and it is a limited medium. That's just inherent to it. But especially now that you know Twitter is so connected with Medium, so the Medium website. Right. I mean, I, it, there's sort of a, you can sort of combine it. It's sort of like in this now ecosystem of different types of um, platforms. Right that you're you're not necessarily constricted by that word limit anymore um right and i think it's really useful and i and i i i'm really um uh, really you know flattered just whenever I, I hear that kind of thing you should be because it's hard to change a person's mind right where we all get this is another form of bias that we all um to some degree or another fall victim to once we believe something we want to keep believing it because it makes us feel smart and righteous and um, and we get attached to it. So you've already, anytime you try to change someone's mind, you've already got an inherently difficult sales job because there's inherent resistance to changing our minds. If you go into that exercise by <laughs> insulting someone, I mean, you've just, you've just made your job uh, significantly more difficult, if not impossible. And if your job is to persuade, then um, I, from uh, this is, well, always telling myself, like, my goal is to persuade. What are the things I can do to increase the chances of persuasion? Um, that's it. Well, keeping myself honest and open to being persuaded in return. And, and what that comes down to in both instances is try to be respectful of people. Don't insult people. Sometimes it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. But it's and, worth you know, a try. And, and I always, I've always, I always try to treat interlocutors and voters and, everybody as a rational actor actually that's like the pin tweet on my profile right you don't want to treat people with whom you disagree as like whining school children who need to yes. be scolded and, and disciplined right you want to treat them as people who have what they perceive to be valid reasons right. for why they believe what they believe right. which probably they do right i mean yeah um, and it's, it's important to remember that when when we when if you disagree with someone in all likelihood they're looking at your viewpoint your worldview your position as equally screwed up and impossible to comprehend as you're looking at theirs, probably. <laughs> it reminds yeah, me yeah. of actually, like anyone who's lived abroad and tried to learn another language or whatever. Um, I spent quite a few years in Japan and I remember like, so everyone's had this experience. So like before I could speak much Japanese, you know, I get in a cab and the cab driver would say something to me and I would be like, like I'm sorry, I don't understand Japanese. <laughs> And the guy would keep talking in Japanese, but louder. <laughs> it's just kind of a human thing because we can't, it's difficult for us to accept that, like, how can you not speak my language? I understand it perfectly. What's wrong with you? Oh, I'll just turn up the volume. And it's like, you got to back away from that and say, there's some other disconnect. Um, I got to find another way to be understood. My language isn't doing it. Maybe yeah. there's a way I can express it in words or in a language that the other person will better understand. Right. So let, let's just go back and actually touch on this Lena Dunham thing briefly, and then we'll wrap, sure. then we'll wrap up. I'm interested actually where your take is, and I'm not I'm not sour about it at all. Really, I actually think it's kind of funny. Well, I um, think so. My biggest feeling about it is that it's really a shame because I think. Well, you, let me let me just lay out the facts please. briefly. First. Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, so on election morning, I think it was or early afternoon. I guess it was morning. Um, I happened to get a tip. I don't know. A tip is sort of a cliche journalistic term, but somebody texted me <laughs> and said, "Hey, check this out. Lena Dunham couldn't have voted for Hillary Clinton in the New York Democratic primary in April." Now, Hillary, now Lena Dunham is a prominent surrogate for the Clinton campaign. She is 
uh, you know, she's on the on the official website as a surrogate. She's going to all the official campaign events, so she's formally associated with the with the Hillary Clinton campaign. She's not just some random supporter. Um, she's you know designated by the Clinton campaign as somebody who's formally within their ranks, right? And she's advanced a lot of kind of just shoddy arguments in favor of Hillary, and she's sort of like a she's sort of just sort of a contemptible person, I think. Um, and again, I don't know her. I don't know what's in her heart, but like her public persona is not something that I find agreeable. Let's I, say I should say I know very little about her. I've seen a couple. Me of neither. I mean, I've never seen her. And I think she is the creator of the HBO show Girls. I think right, which I've never seen. And yeah, that was, that, that, so that was like, I just so just uh, I don't have really any sort of feelings or impression uh, one way or the other, except for the most surface, you know. It's yeah, and that's the same with me. I mean, the reason why I'm even aware of her principally, I mean, I knew, I knew about girls because because it was widely discussed, but I, I never ever right. saw it. Um, just because she entered the political arena on behalf of Hillary, not just you know in the during the primary, so she was actively attempting to dissuade young women from supporting Bernie. Right. Um, she wanted. She thought it was very important to have a first female president. Blah blah blah. Slay queen. All that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so. Well, I got this tip that she hadn't voted in the Democratic primary as claimed. Right. <laughs> so you go to her Instagram, you go to April 19th, she put out this photo of her saying, with the I voted sticker on her shirt. Right. Saying, oh, I just voted, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now how can you verify that she voted, right? You can go on, you can, you can, you have to input her address and date of birth into the New York State voter registration database, which is available to anybody to look at. Right. So how, how did I find her address? Google. I went to Google and typed in Lena Dunham Brooklyn address, and it was the first result. Yeah. Okay. And because and it, it had been widely reported in 2014 that she purchased this landmark property in Brooklyn, the yeah. former headquarters of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which is a um, you know, Brooklyn-based newspaper. Um, and you know, so the, the, all the New York City blogs and, and web, local websites have reported it. So I got it from this right. website, Toplimist, which is like a, a ma totally mainstream news site in New York, in New York City. Yeah. Uh, um, and it had been reported elsewhere. Okay, so I got that within like literally three seconds of Googling. I typed in, then I went to Google, typed in Lena Dunham, right. and that allowed me to get her birth date because it's on her Wikipedia page. Okay, so a grand total of about thirty seconds of research. <laughs> Gave me all the requisite information to go right. to the New York State voter registration database. Right. And put in information, and, and sure enough, popped up no, um, not enrolled in a party. Now, we know that that status was valid as of April because right. per New York State statute, which is so Byzantine and convoluted, yeah. but which I've studied, and which I checked just to verify at the time, um, changes in voters... Uh, if she had changed her, her uh, voter status... After the April primary, which would make no sense, but let's say right. she, theoretically she had, it wouldn't have even been reflected yet in the in the in, in the database because right. the changes are all only processed after the November general election. Right. Um, which is way the way New York does it for whatever kind of stupid reason. Um, so you know, I it was basically confirmed that she could not have been a registered voter. And not, not been a registered Democratic voter right. at the time of the April primary. Now she later, came, and I didn't even realize it at, this, at the time because I was doing like reporting yeah. um, on election day. But like later, somebody, you know, people told me that she actually did a tweet storm responding to it, which is so funny. Um, she said, "Oh, I, you know, this is so stupid." Or, or she, she tried to clear the air on us. I did vote. Okay, so she could have voted, but what she could have done was gone to the polling site and done an affidavit ballot. Hmm. Which anybody can do. I mean, you could be uh, an illegal, uh, you could be an undocumented immigrant, you could be a dog, you could be an a, a space alien, you could be from California, you could be from Greenland. Right. You could walk into a, a New York City polling site and request an affidavit ballot and fill it out. And then you can actually. It vote. Count it. You, you could perform the act of voting, but it doesn't count. So, because it'll be thrown um, out. Right. It would, it's, it's thrown out. Um, yeah. But anybody's entitled to it. Right. Uh, so, anyway. That, I, I honestly didn't even think of that much of it when I reported the information. I thought maybe it caused a, mild, like a little bit of a, of, a, of a stir, but you know, it was election day, other stuff was happening. But sure enough, like a lot people associated with like the anti-online harassment movement, yeah. so the people who've elevated that as like the signature issue of our times, yeah. you know, they they got really incensed about it. You know, I was accused of of, of doxing women. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw some of that. There's only this about one specific woman. Lena Dunham, a multi-millionaire official Clinton surrogate, 
that is we're taken as reflective as women broadly. So you know, half of the country. Yeah. Um, and then, sure enough, like enough, enough people in enough positions of influence Complained. became abreast of it and started complaining to Vice. Yeah, it's um, where it's, I'm an I was an independent I was an independent contractor. Like I was never a full time employee for Vice. I had. Uh, I'm losing you. You froze up. I, I don't know if you can hear me, but the last I heard you said, um, I was not a full-time employee. I was an independent contractor. I had, hmm. uh, no. so, can you hear me uh, now? I can hear you. Yeah. So I you can hear me now. It's dropping off a little. If you're in a hotel, maybe more people are getting online or something and it's okay. Cutting your um, with. I'm not sure. But okay. Go ahead. okay. So, um, so basically, I was an independent contractor for Vice for four uh, for four years, and I had you know agreed with, with them to do some campaign coverage you know on my road trip here. Yeah. Um, and I'm, you know, I had a title as columnist and then contributing writer, and just kind of varied. Um, so enough people complained to Vice that you know, this was somehow wrong or inappropriate, and um, you know, and then my uh, my. Damn, it happened again. Uh, enough people complained so that... ...contrickle that had been in the works for them and and they said they severed the relationship. So that's about it. I mean, what, what was your take on that? To the so that my, my first take was, um, this is really a shame because Vice does some really good, really good investigative journalism. I mean, Jason Leopold is someone I follow pretty closely over there and he does great work, um, which reflects uh, really well on Vice. So at first I thought, what? Why would they do this? And then I realized, and then by the way, he's done a lot of great work, including on the Hillary email issue. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jason's fantastic. I mean, I love that. Um, actually, I, I call him out in my book, The God's Eye View, and uh, the upper echelon of the NSA is complaining about him as the FOIA terrorist. You know. <laughs> so, anyway, um, so uh, oh, I think he froze up again. Nope. Okay, we're there. Sorry. Um, so um, so I just thought it was a terrible shame. And then it was sort of an interesting question, like you, did, can you dox someone whose particulars are already a matter of public record and available with the most trivial Google search? If I, for what it's worth. And who is a powerful figure. I mean, who is not just like a person on the street. Yeah. She's in the public eye. Yeah, you, you, um, you were writing about her in her capacity as uh, Hillary, um, uh, as a Hillary, like, very public Hillary supporter and surrogate. Um, so yeah, it wasn't just some random thing. Uh, if I could, if I were vice management for what it's worth, knowing what I know of this matter, this is the position I would have taken. I would have said, look, it's technically not possible to dox someone whose address is, uh, is like the first Google hit you get if you, if you plug, if you type in their address, but it's also conceivable that someone who wants to invade a person's privacy and didn't it didn't occur to that person that this celebrity figure's address would even be findable in the first place they might not even have done the google search and so what you've done is you've maybe brought to their attention the fact that the celebrity's um address is easily findable when before it wouldn't even have occurred to them and now they know it too i wouldn't call that doxing i would call it the kind of thing like i would have as a conversation and i would personally have just said yeah, Michael, that's something to watch out for next time. Like you don't actually just leave out her address, even though it's not doxing, even though it's findable. Um, and you can make your point about um, about how she couldn't have voted because you know you found her address. And even just the optics of that would be better. I think that's um, that would be a fair position for them to take, even though reasonable people might differ. And um, and I certainly don't think that severing the relationship over this was uh, a proportionate reaction. More a conversation would have been the way I would have gone. I don't think you, I don't think you intend, I, I know you didn't, I can't imagine you intended to cause harm because really there was very little, if any harm that could even have been caused had you been trying. Um, and I don't think you really did cause harm uh, if it's that easy to find her address. So again, a, a conversation, not a termination, I think would have been better for everyone involved. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I mean, I, I'm I, honestly, I mean, the reason why I didn't give it a second thought at the time was because it was so incredibly easy to find the information. So, right? so exactly. That's obvious to me. And if you'd asked me before this happened, do you think there'd be a problem with this? I actually have to think about it some. My first reaction would have been like yours. I would have thought her address is public. 
Um, I'm not, how can you dox someone whose address is public? Upon a little more reflection, I would have said, well, you can't, but like I just said, you know, maybe I'm demonstrating to people who it never would have occurred because she's a pretty big celebrity that you can easily find her address and I've sort of pointed that out for them. All right, maybe there's a better way, like a lower key way to make my point. That's what I would have done. Um, but again, this gets back to what I was saying a little while ago, which is most mistakes are probably made in good faith. If to the extent you made a mistake there, <laughs> you definitely made a tactical mistake, right? Was it a substantive one? Yeah. Um, that's obviously a good faith mistake. Did it cause any harm? Yeah, that's the thing. Hard I mean, to, I, hard to the, say. The hard, to, hard to argue that. You know? Yeah, I mean, the imputation of bad motivation is what I don't like. I mean, you, you would have people like saying that I, uh, I don't even want, I mean, the stuff that I got in response to that just amazing. The, like the, the, the extrapolations people make. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what are you gonna do? It wasn't like um, something in the world. I, I harbor no ill will toward Vice. They always treated me well. Um, I thought so. you handled the whole thing really well online. And um, hey, there's a good lesson to be learned from this. From all, like, I think most of us believe that when we make when we make mistakes, it's in good faith. Uh, to the extent you even made a mistake there, again, clearly you made a tactical one. I, I have no doubt it's obviously a good faith mistake. It's irritating when other people reflexively assign to us bad motives. So I try to remember that when I'm engaging other people. Um, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it served a journalistic purpose too, right? It wasn't just like trying to exact revenge on somebody or some kind of petty <clears throat> personal motive. No, it was like putting information into the universe that hadn't been previously known that demonstrated that a public figure associated with a prominent presidential campaign had deceived the public, right? Yeah, it was That's a mitigating so, factor. I thought you handled this well too. Like um, Sam Biddle of The Intercept, who um, who I think generally does great work. I follow, you know, I read The Intercept pretty closely. And he was giving, he was being sarcastic with you on Twitter about like, wow, you know, thanks to the scoop of the century or words to that effect. And you responded something like, look, it was a tweet. <laughs> it was like- It, it took like, about a minute to do. I mean, it wasn't like a big multi-year multi right, investigation. Like, it's not like I coordinated with Rachel Maddow and said, like, this is going to be an NBC exclusive or anything like that. It was just, you know, it was a tweet. It really just wasn't. Uh, yeah, you know, I don't want to single out him because, like, who cares what he says? I mean, I think he does some good stuff, too. But, like, whatever, he has this sort of ironic detachment that a lot of people on tw in that Twitter cohort do. And they can't, like, you know, they signal for one another. It's this little kind of elite subculture where they all think that they're spectacularly clever and they compliment one another. <laughs> And they have this, and they think that they're rogue, ren like these renegades who have like in intellectual independence, but they have just as much group thing as like Trump supporters in a lot of ways. Um, so, so the, the it's, biggest, it's, it's the biggest it's lesson, I call them uh, w w angry, weird, ironic Twitter. <laughs> it should be an acronym for that. Um, for me, the biggest lesson to be learned there is like if someone else is doing something like that, I try to ask myself, am I doing anything like that? Is there, you know, could I be criticized for something? Similar, and then I try to, I, insofar as possible, I try to do better. But anyway, the whole the Lena the Lena Dunham thing to me was um, pretty classic tempest in a teapot, and I, I really wish um, Vice had just had a conversation with you along the lines that we just had, which I think could be productive because it's yeah, it's something to consider. Going look, you know, the person's address is totally public, but. How much is there to be gained just, versus yeah. how much lost if I if I point out that the address is public? Maybe I it's just you know they, they they have things to consider beyond my personal stake. So um, I you know and I'm not saying this to demean them, but I was expendable to them. Whereas being seen as abetting the doxing of a major celebrity Correct. who was like in this millennial sort well, of target demographic, that's, they, they, just for business reasons and whatever other course. reasons, they they have to had to prioritize that. So, of course, I think that's I think that's uh, yeah, exactly that's an perfectly accurate analysis, which is why I said like on a tactical level, yeah, here, here's the example. Like if you had seen this coming, you would have done it a little differently, I guess, right? I mean, you would have recognized the, um, the tactical, um, the potential tactical fallout. Of right, so there's, there's, there's a tactic, there's a tactic, I mean, tactically it could have been done a little more adroitly, right? Just so I wouldn't have incurred a backlash. Sure. But I think ethically it was still the correct thing to do. I mean, that's my position. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with that. I think, um, Okay, but enough about that. I mean, um, <laughs> any uh, any concluding thoughts? Well, first, it's really a pleasure just to talk to you like this for an hour. And, uh, and I want to thank you, not just for all the great reporting you've done, but also for giving me an outlet for the last hour and a half 
to talk about so many things that I've been busting to write about for the last month, but I've got a deadline on this new novel and I've been trying so hard. Presidential campaign is really time to, hard time to try to finish a manuscript. There are so many aspects of this campaign that have interested me enormously. I could have been writing about it every day, but I just can't uh, because it's, it's just the real world is a big distraction when you're trying to imagine a world that doesn't really exist. So thanks. It was, um, it was, not just enjoyable, but kind of cathartic for me to be able to talk about some of yeah, these issues. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. You know, that's why I, I appreciate this format. So, like, I guess what would you call it, long form conversation or interview, that kind of thing? Because sure. people have sort of like people have a bunch of all sorts of thoughts that are just sort of jumbling around, and they can't necessarily get it out into public. Right. Um, but when you just kind of airing them in this sort of um, format, I think yeah, it can be cathartic, and it's cathartic for me as well because. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are invested, you know, a lot of people want to hear about yeah. this topic right now. I mean, they can't, they, they're like us where like they, they find it difficult to focus on much else or at least for me. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's been, it's been a hell of a, a five days since the election. So for anyone who's, um, who's coming in at the end or who has uh, sat through this whole thing, I would just, I would just say this for me, it's really not about trying to learn lessons from. Uh, from this election, I think my views on the uh, respective merits and demerits of the candidates are probably uh, reasonably clear at this point. I mean, Trump is a catastrophe, is a con man, a fraud, and a demagogue, and uh, and about the the last thing that uh, America should want is a president. But okay, now we're going to get him. And uh, for me, the point isn't to blame anyone for uh, contributing to the rise of Trump. The point is just to do what the military calls an after action report and to ask what could have been done better? <clears throat> what can we learn so that next time we can do better? That's the most useful exercise possible. And, um, and anything that people wanna focus on that makes that exercise more difficult, less likely or less productive is probably the wrong thing to focus on. Yeah, I personally think um, we're in intractable imperial decline, so all of that is pointless. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just kidding. There's always there's always an upside. Um, oh, so, this is silver lining. Yeah. Okay. So this is yeah, this is great, and I'm gonna uh, cease now. You know, you can tell how professional I am at this because I didn't even introduce you or you know, stay where people can find you. But yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. I didn't. I mean, they'll they'll, they'll didn't see you on Twitter, and they can go check out. Yeah, go check out your 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 your, your work and. Buy your stuff and well, there's probably, keep an eye out. When you put this up on YouTube, you can probably put our names in the description. Of yeah, the yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> that, okay. That's the extent of my um, my promotional. Look, know, man. Uh, I mean, really, like I, I was just uh, excited by the prospect to converse with you for an hour or so, and any follow-on benefits of you know people discovering me somehow or another as a result were speculative and relatively unimportant. <laughs> so, okay. Um, All right. Very good. Let's let's good luck uh, with end everything. here. Yeah. Okay, you too. We'll do it Bye bye. Cheers. Yeah, we should. Bye.